to another stock market open live stream. Wow. Uh, Google got fined $700 million. But you know what's crazy? What you might not actually read in articles that talk about this, but you would actually read on eHack uh, e if you went to eHack.com, uh, is you'd realize that Google nets like $666 million per day. So in other words, they basically got fined one day and a few minutes of net income. Google had free cash flow of over $60 billion in the three months so far in 2023. They had net income of over $19 billion in a Q3 alone. Google's got plenty of money. And even after their capital expenditures, they have roughly $20 million or sorry, $20 billion uh, per quarter available, which is uh, absolutely wild uh, to think about. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, little things that, that that I like to consider. Uh, and hold on, let me, let me make sure I uh, calculated that correctly. Actually, sorry, that's that's per quarter. Oh, okay, sorry. It'd be closer to, because if I do per quarter, uh, okay, I might be slightly off on that. Uh, let me see here, because if we're at 20 billion a quarter, I do it. Yeah, okay. All right. So closer, closer to like th three to four days. Let me correct this. Hold on a sec. Just doing the math right now. Uh, yeah, three days. Three days. My bad. <laughs> uh, closer to just three days. Ah, I divided by a month rather than a quarter. Fact checking myself here uh, on the fly. But anyway, the point is, it's like it's a drop in the bucket. You see these massive settlements of these companies, but these companies, they make so much money. And that's what I wanted to start with is Google and Microsoft and even Apple. They make so much money. It's absolutely insane uh one of the ones uh, like for example i like looking at uh, microsoft's uh, um income that they can make boy uh and, and i'll show you how simple we could do this uh, sometimes people forget how easy it is to do this so uh microsoft investor relations uh, and let's take a look and just see how microsoft is doing i always like going to the sec filings because they're standard and we can always get the same style of report for every single company, it's actually a great thing. Uh, there's sort of a standard way we look at these. Uh, but anyway, what I like doing is going over here. Look at this cash flow. So here's Microsoft, $22.2 billion of net income in a quarter. It's almost the same as Google. In fact, they make a little bit more. They make like 10% more than Google. Uh, so uh, yeah, kind of wild to think about. Oh, yeah. The date is wrong on the uh, title. Thank you for that. I'll fix that. Uh, so point is, the uh, regulators in uh, in sort of our uh, in our world in our realm, they they come out with these what appear to be really large fines to us as individuals who who look in from the outside, and it's like, oh my gosh, this is this is so damaging. This is huge. Not really. It's three days of of money. I mean, Google's probably like, we'll we'll make more money just settling with you all and getting you out of our lives. So you're taking three days of our bottom line, big deal. Like, let's get this over with and move on. <laughs> so pretty remarkable to think about that. In addition to that, uh, already had an update this morning on uh, the Fed, specifically uh, Mary Daly suggesting that there's definitely a risk of over-tightening, uh, which I thought was very interesting to start seeing that uh, coming from the Fed already. Uh, that's yesterday in the Meet Kevin podcast. We talked about how I believe that when Jerome Powell gave his presser last week, he was coming across as almost nervous and fearful. And I was wondering, wow, you know, he's and he's being so dovish with this. It's not like he's hawking and he's fearful of recession. Otherwise, he'd be hawking. Instead, it almost feels like he felt guilty, that he feels like he had gone too far already. And that by going too far already, I think j Powell's is a little nervous that it's going to create a lot more joblessness than he bargained for. So I think that's why we saw that flip there. Uh, oh, uh, let's listen in over here to some data. It starts expected to be up around 1.36 million, 1, 1,560,000. That is a big pop. And if we look at permits, similar, similar, but nowhere near the extent. We we're expecting 1,465. We got 1,460. And we had a nice revision to last month 
from 1,487,000 to 1,498,000. Of course, these are seasonally adjusted annualized units. So let's dig down a little bit. 1,560,000, that is the best read since May. Best read since May and the second best read of the year. So that is really nice. Not seeing much action in the markets on a follow through side. And as I said, permits largely as expected. Now, here's the deal. If we look at interest rates for the month of November, we could probably get some clues. That was right at the tail end of the 8% we saw in October. We clipped it for like the first day of November. Then rates just started to slide down. So the range was basically 8% for a nanosecond down to 760. So never got below 7.5%. We know that in December, of course, rates are moving lower. We may expect a bigger pop or continuation of this move. So we want to pay close attention. Right now, we did see rates move up just a bit. We we're down uh, two basis points. Now we're down one basis point and twos, uh, threes. Uh, a 10-year have been down three, haven't moved much. And if you were to look at a chart of 10-year, Becky, and, and this as a technician should jump out, we're hovering at very low interest rates, lowest going all the way back to the summer. And for the last three sessions, today being the third, it's very much a sideways action, hovering right around that 390 or a little bit higher towards 395. Uh, there has been no bounce to the ounce in interest rates. Bank of Japan had no surprises today. I can't see anything that's going to reverse some of the pressures of lower interest rates at the moment. The big question is how the long end eventually escapes the rest of the yield curve and right. some of the good cop, bad cop games being played on the short end by Fed governors and Federal, Federal Reserve officials that, of course, are trying to continue to walk back the good cop, bad cop of Powell's expression that the last meeting was all about cutting interest rates. Becky, back to yeah, you. Yeah, that is certainly what it's felt uh, What it's felt like to me too, Rick, just trying to push things back on, on the market's interpretation of what Powell said last week. When you were talking 8%, you were talking the 30-year mortgage. Uh, getting Because I, I thought I yes, saw 30-year yeah. mortgage. I'm so sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah bank year rates today. average 30-year mortgage. Yeah, and the 30-year mortgage today, I thought it was, it was sitting just above 7%. Um, we haven't shown it's it. It's under now. It's like 6, 9 or something. right now. Um, and and wow. you can see the way it so started to come down movement. in November, right? Yeah. Yes, it's a lot of movement. And I fully suspect that when we get some of the December. Uh, she's right. It was under 6.9 there for a moment. Uh, and then it popped right back over. So it's like 7.1 right now. Uh, so it's kind of teetering right on that line. Now, keep in mind sort of my thoughts on this. Uh, it's not a surprise. I have, uh, by the way, I posted a house hack update. If you haven't seen that yet, uh, it's house hack homes. It's actually linked in the description on this video below. So below this, if you expand the description, you'll see all the channels, market open live podcast, uh, politics, which I'm turning into just chatting. I'm still working out on figuring out exactly how I want to do this. I have some ideas, so stay tuned for that. I'm pretty excited about that. <clears throat> and then we've got a house hack. Uh, so check that out. I posted a full video. Uh, we talked about yesterday in the uh, house hack update, uh, we gave a valuation update for house hack. So if you're curious about the uh, <clears throat> potential valuation update for house hack, my real estate startup, check that out uh, in that link down below. So as, as far as the data, though, this, uh, like seeing a beat here in uh, starts and, it, and essentially flat here on permits, but that beat on starts, it's not actually a surprise, mostly because. I believe as soon as the Federal Reserve indicated, oh, okay, we're basically at peak and it's time to start cutting rates. And I saw this in the market as well. In November, everybody started going crazy again. People started people started getting really excited, overly excited. Uh, and, and so some of the competition I'm seeing is being a little, in my opinion, too euphoric over, over rate cuts. But it's not a surprise seeing builders sort of turn it into high gear, if you will. Uh, so that way they can be prepared for what they think might be a banger year next year. Uh, I, you know, I'm not convinced we're going to see real estate prices explode next year, but uh, I also am not ex uh, expecting them to crash either. So uh, expect more of a uh, more, more flatness. Is some of my thought. Let me listen to the rest of what they're suggesting here. Bring down the inflation rate. 
If right. So they the, can't do that. Right. They, they, this this plays into what we're thinking for the rest of the year. You don't get it unless this happens. You don't get it unless this happens. And if okay. the decline in mortgage rates creates a reacceleration in home buying and that creates a reacceleration in home prices, the Fed doesn't get what it's after on inflation. So I'll Second just say third iteration of we, these things. We need to but it, watch it, but there's this. There's a log jam. There is a there log is jam a log and it jam. is real. We need more supply. We also need more supply. We do know there was a nice article. I guess it was the journal the other day. I don't know if it was the Times where they said that um, people want to buy, but sellers aren't selling. And so you haven't right. had or figured out even what the market clearing price is going to be in the real estate market. And, and as I pointed out over many, many months here, mortgage rates are high relative to even where they should be with the 10 year. They've been three percentage points above the 10. Typically they run two percentage points above the 10. So there was scope for mortgages to come down even if the 10 year didn't fall and yet the 10 year fell. So now um, it's possible we're gonna be below 7% sometime soon here. Oh, goody. Yeah. Um, yeah. Steve, <laughs> and, and... Yeah, as if that's like such a big deal, right? <laughs> uh, we uh, yeah. spoke earlier this morning. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, wow. All right, well, interesting on starts. Uh, next catalyst, by the way, we've got existing home sales will come out tomorrow along with consumer confidence. On Thursday, we'll go ahead and get GDP annualized Q on Q, and uh, then we'll get PCE on the 22nd. Uh, We've talked yeah. about this, that, that the Fed right. made a single word change to their policy statement. The, the forecasts are not policy, they're simply forecasts. And, and, and while the average Fed official gave three, the market took six. And nobody maybe is better than Joe at talking about uh, how the market can over-exaggerate over, over exaggerate, uh, But you uh, agree moves. with what Rick just said and what I was thinking, too, is that every Fed official we've heard from since then has tried to walk it back. They're, they're don't walk it back. They're trying to push back and say, here's what we said. I don't know right. what you, you guys, guys are heard. stupid for your interpretation. Here's That's what, here's, good, right. right, right. And why that is is an interesting question. I think there's still maybe too much money in the system for the Fed to get a controlled response to a controlled change in policy. Okay. Steve, thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, you know, I don't think this whole like pushback from from the Fed officials or whatever is like, quite frankly, really that big of a deal. Uh, a lot of people keep bringing this up. Like, oh, you know, Goolsby and all these people coming out trying to push back. This is they do this every single month. It's like they, they all got to kind of try to manipulate and balance things a little bit in each direction. It's it's uh, it's really not a big deal. Uh, Thorin here says, House Hack video was solid. Watched it right before this. Oh, thank you for that. That's awesome. Super cool. Great video on House Hack. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. BOJ will finally raise their rates in mid-24, in your opinion, suggests someone here. huh? We'll see. They, they, they got to try to get up that inflation. Are we in Goldilocks land? You know, uh, I've, I've been of this mindset for about a year now that um, we'll have a volatile swoosh, Nike swoosh recovery. Uh, it's uh, it, I think that's been very, very true uh, so far. And uh, yeah, there are definitely risks that could derail this. I mean, we've, we've got that the, the darn shipping scenario or situation, which is uh, unfortunately getting worse and not better. Uh, we're hoping that uh, the U.S. will be a little bit more, uh, how should I say, uh, involved in, uh, in quote unquote, policing uh, that uh, the channel there, but uh, the shipping channel. Uh, but boy, if we don't, yeah, we're, we're going to have, uh, you know, there, there is concern of substantially more cost for shippers having to basically go around the coast of Africa uh, versus through the canal. Now, that means the product will still be delivered. And so shipping costs will go up, which could be inflationary. Uh, and I think that's why we're starting to see some uh, of the oil price movement that we've seen. But quite frankly, the market isn't pricing in so much fear at the moment. Uh, I like to look at oil prices and say, okay, well, how bad is the situation? Look at what the oil markets are doing. I generally think of this as a great way to understand. And uh, I, like, look at the spike. I want you to see the spike on the far right side. See where this little green arrow is right here where my mouse is? You see that giant spike where the green arrow is? Yeah, no, you can't see it, right? Oh, sorry. Hold on. Let me zoom into the one year. Do you see that spike over there by the green arrow? You know, the one like that comes out of uh, the early December, you know, era, era right over here. Because remember, we've had some of these Houthi attacks going on in November as well. They've only just recently gotten worse. 
And so can you see that spike by the little red arrow there? No, still no. Okay. How about now? Can you see that like dramatic amount of fear the oil market has for this Houthi issue? Yeah. <laughs> but so like, I, I, like, I, I get it. I get it. It's, it's something the bears can talk about, but like clearly oil traders aren't that worried. Uh, I know it's a, it seems like a lot, Twenty or sorry, 7.8 million barrels of crude flow through this area. But keep in mind, the U.S. produces around 20 million per day itself. That's all from EHAC, by the way. Uh, about 12% of seaborne traded oil and 8% 8, uh, 8 of liquefied natural gas passes through here. That's why it matters. And uh, obviously escalating tensions here because of the conflict in Israel. Can your plane fly abroad? Yes. Uh, just, you stop in Iceland, bro. <laughs> so let's see what else we got here. What people won't tell you, the best deals are off market before an agent touches it. Um, not, not actually always. That's a great wholesaler mentality. Uh, but <clears throat> just because a deal is off market doesn't actually make it a good deal. Uh, I've bought plenty of deals off market. Uh, you know, even for house hack, we've bought deals off market. So there can be great deals off market. I mean, we just bought like two or three off market at least. Actually, at least three. We might be on four off market. So we definitely buy off market. But I see a lot of wholesalers. They're like, oh, yeah, the only good deal you can get is off market. That's because they're trying to sling you sometimes deals that are a little overpriced. <laughs> so you have to <clears throat> you have to underwrite everything. Right? <clears throat> Sorry. But yeah, yeah, you have to underwrite everything whether it's on market or not. Like I was looking at a multifamily building yesterday and uh, I parked outside of it and I started looking at the building. I'm like, wait a minute. I think that's the owner right there. And I found the owner and I just walked right up to the owner. He was working with a vendor on on renovating the, the garage. I, I didn't really like the building, but it was funny because I was joking with him. I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I saw you 1031 and he's like, nah, just getting out. And I'm like, ah, yeah, everybody always says real estate's passive income, but it isn't, huh? And he laughed and just kind of like shook his head like, no. Yeah, real estate's hard work. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think that's why uh, it's it, it's so challenging for, for people to kind of do real estate at scale because it's not easy. I love it though. <laughs> but anyway, so going back to uh, some of these uh, shipping updates. Uh, let's see what the latest is that we have here. So regarding shipping, we've got dozens of containers bringing manufactured goods from Asia to Europe are being set off on an arduous detour around Africa. Okay. Uh, Maersk, uh, which owns a fleet of more than 300 shipping containers on Tuesday said it will divert its fleet around Africa. Yeah. So you add lead times. So basically what you're saying is, you know, you're going to get companies, you're going to have to pre-order a little bit more ahead of time. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't see a lot of this as, as, terribly dramatic although it can worsen it is it is a this is like a little tinder box 15 merchant ships have come under attack since the war began in october the uh, houthis designated as terrorist organization the seaway is vital because any ship wanting to get in uh or from egypt suez canal uh, to cut between europe and asia must go through it alternative is to go around africa adding weeks to cargo delivery and the waterway has become even more important for the transport of oil since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, especially for Moscow's own exports. <laughs> even though Moscow's getting smacked. So uh, there's an interesting little chart here, uh, graph, or uh, not graph, we we'll call this a map. I'll show you a little map here so you can see this. Uh, I like the colors of it. <laughs> not that those really matter. There we go. Take a look at this. So this right now shows you Europe-bound shipping containers are heading for the southern tip of Africa, avoiding the threat of attacks in the Red Sea. The detour adds about 10 to 14 days to the journey. So you can see that right here. Boop. I don't know why they made the ship look like little sperms, but they do. Yeah, and you kind of see them all going this way. As opposed to cutting through here. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. Awesome. 
All right. So what else do we have? Uh, let's see. So that's shipping. So we'll keep an eye on shipping, obviously. Then we have... Oh, let's see. The housing data this morning wasn't that big of a deal. I want to look a little bit more at what um, Mary Daly suggested. So she was concerned about over-tightening. Fed daily rate cuts may be needed next year to prevent over-tightening. We discussed that. Fed just wants to make sure we don't we we don't give price stability, but take away their jobs. You know, that's actually such a good line. And that's the panic that I saw from Jerome Powell. Uh, that's it's it literally characterizes it perfectly. Because do you remember? And this is so critical. I, I think people forget what Jerome Powell said. Does anybody remember? If you've been watching, you should, because I've highlighted this a few times. What did Jerome Powell say about prices coming down? Like basically prices going back to 2019 levels. What did he say? Think about that for a moment. He's weak for not 1031 exchanging. Bro, the guy was like 80. <laughs> Uh, somebody who says, is 2024 going to be the best year for bonds, not financial advice? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. It, it depends. Will, will 2024 be the best year for bonds or will November and December of 2023 have been the best year for bonds? <laughs> the best two months, right? Uh, it depends. Uh, I actually think we'll, we'll probably have more, more positivity ahead in 2024 for, for bonds. That's uh, so why I'm, I'm still holding my TMF. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, tactical reviews here basically says it, get a job <laughs> or Scott down counter and says, uh, just, just make more money. Yeah, there it is. Need to make more. Yeah. So how would that be possible if they took away your jobs? Right. So think about it. How would it be possible to, to basically say, look, we're not going to bring prices down. Just go make more money. How would it be possible to make more money if they caused a, a job loss recession? So. <clears throat> Uh, you know, I, I think they, I think any of these, these, first of all, I think Goolsby is a clown. Uh, I, 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 maybe that's harsh, but I feel like he just sort of parrots what he's being told to say. Uh, because last year he was like this, this big dove, uh, you know, he came out of nowhere, got a job at the Fed or wherever he came from. I want to see where he came from, came from. And, you know, then he's parroting how everything's just, uh, uh, yeah, you know, supposed to be dovish as Jerome Powell's hawking. Now Jerome Powell goes dovish and, and he's having to put on the hawk costume. And I feel like they may as well just dress him up in like a clown costume because like they're trying to put a show on for us. They come out with like the little, the horns, you know, and like the little squeaky duck. And they're like, hawk, 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 hawk. Uh, it's, it's stupid. Um, you know, it, it's just to try to like massage the messaging. Yeah, it, it's like, virtually worthless uh at least his interview yesterday i thought was pretty worthless so who was he, he was on the council of economic advisors before uh working over at the fed uh oh he was chief staff to paul volcker at the president's economic recovery advisory board during the 2008 uh recovery financial crisis mm. continues to write as a columnist today uh, for the New York Times. Economic scene. All right. Well, there you go. Huh. All right. Good for him. I still think he's clowning because they're telling him to put on a clown costume. Anyway, <clears throat> let's listen over here. I think you may be, I think it may be lost for you, Joe. I think you should stay where you are. You're yeah. Good at like an, I'm an old dog. I, I have trouble <laughs> with old tricks. Uh, oh, wait, Ursula, thank you. Good, good, Thank you. Good, very interesting. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. In the meantime, Google reaching a nine-figure antitrust settlement agreement with the United States Dang. and consumers. That Big deal. Centered on accusations that Google overcharged users through unlawful restrictions on the distribution of Android apps and unnecessary fees for transactions within the apps. As part of the settlement, the tech giant will allow for greater competition in its Play App Store and pay $700 million. Most of that will go toward a fund for consumers, while $70 million will go to the states. Google did not admit wrongdoing, and the settlement still needs a judge's final approval. And Joe, I think this is the one we were talking about earlier, where if you're waiting for your take in this, 
Two bucks. Two dollars. That's what you can hope for. Two dollars, which um, I was trying to figure out. Uh, I, I have made two dollar bets, Becky. I do. Oh, I bet recently. Too, I do. Right? I make two dollar bets. There's no bet too, too small. Um, it, it's ridiculous. I don't know why. I don't know why I do it. And I still, it fun. and it puts me in a bad mood when I lose. Thank you. Coming <laughs> up. You lose two dollars. Yes, it does. Coming up. Yeah, I don't know what they're talking about here. Two dollars. But <clears throat> anyway, yeah, it's a $1.7 trillion company. Uh, like we said, this is like three days of income for them. It's, it's a joke. Uh, net income, mind you. Not, not gross. <clears throat> it's, it's way less uh, on, uh, on a gross basis. So anyway, all right, what do we got here? Fed, uh, Fed uh, pivot, Spark's biggest equity inflow in year. Traders plowed money into U.S. equities at the largest daily pace last Wednesday after Fed Chair Powell gave the clearest signal yet that the central bank's aggressive rate hiking campaign is finished in an optimistic sign heading into the final trading session of 2024, sessions of 2024. Money is still finding its way back into stocks. Investors poured a net $24 billion into equities on Fed Day, the biggest one-day total in the year. Wow. Holy smokes, that's amazing. Uh, a significant rise in equity flows continued Thursday with 15.7 funneled into stocks as some cash came off the sidelines with U.S. money markets ending the week with their biggest outflow since October 12th. Wow, it's happening. It's happening. That transition uh, that we've been expecting of money from money markets to stocks is occurring. Because again, you know, if you're in money markets, that's great. But remember that 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 rate you're getting is fleeting. So, you know, you might be like, oh, well, okay, what's my opportunity cost of sitting in uh, money markets versus stocks? And you might say, okay, well, if stocks on average yield, say 15% in 2024, let's just say I'm making it up, okay? And my yield is 5% on money markets. Well, then my opportunity cost is the difference, 10%, right? The problem is money markets are going to fall. So as money market rates fall to, let's say, 4% by the end of the next year, your, your opportunity cost actually grows. So the longer you're out of stocks, the more the cost of sitting in an opportunity or in a money market fund grows because those yields go down. Uh, yeah, so this makes a lot of sense. Like if you're in, if you really want a yield farm, I'm still a big fan of treasuries because then you could get capital appreciation and yield. In fact, if you watch uh, the house hack uh, video, the valuation video update that I made uh, in it, you'll see me talk about credit line for house hack and some of the R we're looking at. It's kind of cool. So check that out. All right, what else? Uh, we've got uh, let's see here. Traders are looking for confirmation. The Fed is done raising rates. I mean, I think that's that's already pretty obvious at this point. And let's go take a look at what some pre market is doing right now. And are they saying anything here? At some of the the morning's top. Free market movers, you see? No, okay, they're doing what I'm about to do, which is look to see what's going on over here. All right, free market. Uh, let's start at the bottom. NVIDIA, it's somehow down 1.6%, but uh, it is uh, it is still sitting at $492. It's really having a strong resistance at five. I think when this sucker actually holds five, Oh my gosh, it's going to be pretty glorious. Now that is, uh, many of you know, I, I run an actively managed ETF and uh, NVIDIA is right now, well, as of yesterday, 10.04% of it, Enphase is 14% of it, and Tesla is 14.9% of it. Uh, and it's it's interesting, The uh, I think I personally think Nvidia becomes more of a sell once you're in like a seven handle. I think there's a chance there's going to be this explosion above five as money starts flowing in because people coming out of money markets. I think a lot of them sort of disengage from the stock market and be like, "All right, what should we, you know, invest in or whatever?" And uh, it wouldn't surprise me for people to to have this rubber band approach towards some of the biggest names uh, and then potentially bet on solar. 
Solar, I think, will be really interesting. Next, as as rates fall, solar is just going to lap the pain of last year. And it should be glorious, in my opinion. And no guarantees. Obviously, we can't make those sort of guarantees. This is just generic market commentary here. Uh, you know, not invest personalized financial advice. But anyway, Enphase, for example, one of the reasons I like my exposure here is yes, there's been a lot of volatility, uh, a lot of volatility, and it's been it's been straight down for for a very long period of time. Uh, but now it's coming out of that hole, and it's really starting to rally as finally rates are set in. And this is where a lot of people are like, Kevin, why, why are you holding that dog stock end phase or whatever? And I'm like, because I believe rates are going to come down. They're going to come down more rapidly than people think. And then interest rate sensitive stocks like Tesla and end phase are going to do very well. And I'm going to uh, balance that with less interest rate sensitive stocks like my chip uh, makers, you know, the designers and the makers. So, uh, you know, that's that's just my POV. So anyway, uh, yeah, feels like it's going to be a glorious 2024. You stole my adjective. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of wild, but I saw David Sachs on Twitter freaking out about how the Fed is basically just doing Biden Biden's bidding. So whether or not that's true, uh, from the Fed's POV. I think it's going to look true for the Biden camp. Like it, it is going to be real, like a strong economic recovery here for the Biden camp is going to be critical. In fact, Trump's been freaking out about the stock market going up. And now he's basically saying the stock market going up is just enriching the rich. Because now, you know, it's, it's easy to bag on Biden when the economy is bad because most people are pocketbook voters. But if the economy does recover in the next year and we stick a soft landing, uh, it's going to be harder for Trump and easier for Biden. You know, I, I'm not trying to like impute any direction here. I don't really care. Uh, it's me. I don't, you know, and it doesn't matter. I'm just going to report what it is. But, uh, but yeah, the best thing you could hope for if you're Biden is that this market just rallies between now and the election, honestly, which obviously there'll be ups and downs, but if money keeps flowing in from money markets, there might be a lot more ups than downs. So it'll be really interesting. So after providing a non-biased view, uh, this person says, Kevin is literally retarded. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a very logical argument you got there. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Tyler here thinks institution, like, Congress is actually going to be capable of passing a bill banning institutions from buying single family homes. Have you ever studied history where this has been tried like 50 times in the past? It fails every single time. Have you ever studied Congress to realize that they introduce bills in election years or right before election years that are politically popular, but have no chance of passing? Call me when there's actually a chance <laughs> and we'll solve the problem. It's not a big deal. Yeah, Max, that was actually a good piece in the journal. I saw that's so like the top front page on the Wall Street Journal. Tesla wannabes face a cash crunch. This is what what we've been talking about for years is that if it, like these companies, they do not make enough money uh, to to really, in my opinion, merit good investments, even though they might make good cars. And you could try to speculate on the bottom. But look at this, for example. So this is on eHack. If you do a command uh, F for Neo, okay? So like this is literally eHack. It's totally free here. So go check it out, eHack.com. And just check, update it every so often. But look at this. I put Neo in here with the annotated Neo Investor Relations Report. You could literally just click on the link and then it'll give you my highlights and annotations on these documents. So you don't have to do any of that crap anymore. Like you could just click on the link. It's it's I make it so easy for you. And it goes right to a PDF that's annotated with my research. But anyway, yesterday I talked about NEO on eHack. And I talked about how uh, NEO uh, is, is actually um, in, in this, this place where in order for them to just break even, they need to manufacture about four times as many cars as they're manufacturing right now just to get break even or to break even, unless they're able to pop margin above the 11% they have now, or they drop their OPEX. 
Yeah. So really interesting. <clears throat> Boy, Tyler or, or try or whatever. Kevin is back to buy high and hold bag strategy. Like how much of an idiot are you? Uh, you're suggesting that I'm buying right now. Like you're so dumb. <laughs> like it's it, it, clearly you're either not around here or what. Uh, but uh, it's, pre it's pretty amazing. So um, let's see. It's the economy stupid wins. That's very true. Uh, it, it People are pocketbook voters. And I mean, when you think about it, to some extent, the point of voting is to express your personal, um, you know, what, what is best for you and your family, right? Like if you are ex like a devout Catholic, uh, you you might uh, be heavily incentivized to vote uh, for, uh, you know, anti-abortion candidates, right? Uh, if you are an average American who's struggling with pricing and you want you want more jobs and, you know, your company's getting handouts from the government and they're able to hire more people because of this and the economy starts doing better and, and you know, things are rotating up, you know, you're going to vote in a way that, that that doesn't potentially risk that, right? Whereas when the economy is in the doldrums, like it was, let's say, in 2008, uh, and you're in a recession and Lehman Brothers collapses, you're going to be like, hey, man, I'm going to vote for this new guy on the street, this young guy, Obama, because it's the hope of change that we can believe in, right? That's It's very, very common uh, that in very tumultuous times uh, to, to have a, um, uh, you know, to vote for what is best for your own situation. Uh, and so that that remains to be seen what that will be for people in uh, in November of 2024. I think that'll be very, very interesting. Voters are very fickle investments. Oh, I completely agree with that. Completely agree with that. It's it's like literally like, it's like the wind, <laughs> you know? It's like today everyone's here. There's, and really you're not actually talking about like the, the very uh, devout Biden supporters or the devout Trump supporters. They don't matter. Who matters is, is the middle voter, the middle, like that, that little sliver of like three or four million swing voters in the middle. They decide the elections. Wild. Uh, yeah. Let's see. What else here? If this trend continues, the number of unemployed could outpace the number of available jobs sometime between late Q1 and 2024. Uh, I don't know if that's true. Let's see here. Let's go to, I want to look at the economic calendar. So if we go to the eco calendar and we look at jobs and we go to the beginning of the year, a month rather, jolts we have, jolts came in at 8.7. And then we go to... payrolls. Here we go. Non-farm payrolls, we came out with 199. But what we could do is we could look at the actual number of unemployed. Jobs report, uh, BLS. Every time I write BLS, I just want to write BS. <laughs> okay. So the number of unemployed stands at 6.3 million. So you're suggesting basically the job openings will go below 6.3 million. So far, that unemployed number has been relatively stable at that 6.3 for a while. And the jolts has been around nine. So we've been kind of like almost one and a half X. So you actually do have buffer there, but you're right. I think that weak jolts number came as such a surprise to the fed that that actually sort of forecast this fed weakening. And keep in mind, the unemployment figure doesn't include everybody who's unemployed. You have these other U measures of unemployment as well. Uh, such as the uh, long-term unemployed or those who are underemployed. So, uh, for example, there are 4 million who are uh, employed part-time for economic reasons who would have preferred full-time employment. So, like, if you add that together, then you have more unemployed than you have job openings, right? But you could do this every single time because you could go 6.3 million plus 4 million and then another 1.6 million marginally attached to the labor force. Now you actually have more unemployed when you count like this uh, compared to how many you have, uh, how many job openings you have. But uh, I don't like to do that because 
it, it's very complicated to do that on every single month basis and then remember how you added it all together. So I just personally, I like to look at the inflection points of that ratio of the jolts number. And we're at like one four. I mean, let's do it. It's 6.3 divided by 8.7. So 6.3 million divided by 8.7. Uh, or let me divide it by the other way. 8.7 divided by 6.3. Yeah, that's better. 1.38. So we're at 1.3 job openings per unemployed person right now. So, uh, yeah, that that will probably continue to inflect. Buy now, pay never. Uh, I actually think that is a very real concern. Uh, but a firm smart, uh, we, and I know they're, they've been doing very well in ripping as rates have been coming down. Uh, what they do is, you know, they're, they're trying to sell off their their loans, basically, to, uh, to third-party uh, institutions. And so what you're really doing is you're not holding the bag on these crap loans, basically. Uh, you are making them, taking a fee, and then you you dump the loan on basically anyone else. <laughs> so it's, it's not a terrible idea. Uh, and yeah, good call, Max. So you've got here a firm expands self-checkout at Walmart stores. Yeah. A firm holdings climb 4% in pre-market on expanded Walmart packed. Yep. Lawmakers query pharmacy chains on customer privacy. Walmart workers seek a court nod for COVID screening. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, BNPL, it's, it's very interesting, but it's, it's also it's scary. I, I personally am uh, not the biggest fan of, of people using BNPL, but people do. You know, I, I, I think ideally don't spend it. Who in the world is using BNPL at self-checkout? Uh, people are using BNPL all the time on groceries. You'd be, you'd be blown away. Uh, because the way you could do it is you could pay for it on your credit card. And then you can enable BNPL after the fact. So you can already BNPL basically almost anything you want. Uh, so kind of wild to think about. All latest data and macro points to hyperinflation. Numbers don't show it yet because data is obviously manipulated for elections, but prices don't lie. All right, digital pomni. Give it to me. Give me the data. Give me the data, please. Show me where outside of ski tickets and aerospace. Outside of those two sectors, please show me where there's hyperinflation. Is it in manufacturing? No. Is it in freight? No. Is it in consumer goods? Absolutely not. Uh, is it, it like, I don't know, man, where is it? Is it in autos? No. Uh, is it in houses? No. Uh, is it in rents? No. You know, you want to go like nuanced and go, oh, but like some medical care services and health insurance are up a little bit. Okay. I mean, like things fluctuate on a month over month basis. Like where, where, where is your latest data? On hyperinflation because you know it's really easy to come into the chat and be like hey we got we got hyperinflation boys and girls you're like you're like that creepy clown who walks into the kid's birthday party hey kids look what i got hyperinflation <laughs> to blow up your balloon of fraud <laughs> like you got nothing dude <laughs> Uh, again, I'll wait. I'll wait because I'm willing to highlight the dialogue. I'm willing to look at what you're going to say, but I don't think you got anything. Uh, and if you do, I'm happy to admit that you do, but I don't see it. So in the meantime, yeah. Uh, all right. So let's listen in over here to CNBC. Very good day. Uh, very good day. Uh, oh, come on, bro. Come on, dude. No. <laughs> Come on, you can't say that. You can't come on like the creepy clown. Hyperinflation is everywhere. The data's rigged. <laughs> and then I'm like, give me one example. And then your response is, well, it's my opinion. If you don't like it, fine by me. Bro. <laughs> oh, come on, man. You had your chance. Making too much money and the multiples are too high. Now that make me look foolish, okay? Maybe the people in the investment club will say, what a fool, he just took gigantic profits. That has never defined a fool in my career. 
Right. Making money is never defined right. being a fool. Well, that stupid Kramer, he just took a gigantic gain. What a bozo. <laughs> that, that, that tends to... He's sounding a little bitter today. I mean, what, what would Icon say about selling Netflix for a huge gain, but prior to an even bigger run? Or what? Apple. Or <laughs> Apple. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, those... if he'd held on to both of those, he'd be one of the richest guys in the world. Basically. Well, OK. I mean, if Warren Buffett were selling some Apple and no, I, you know, Apple and NVIDIA are two, the two stocks I say, own them, don't trade them. All right. This is exhausting. So uh, Rob here asks, what part of the yield curve do you think represents the best value? It depends how long you're going to hold on to it. You know, I think um, there are a lot of people making bets on the short short end. I actually would make bets on the long end. That's my POV, not personalized financial advice. Uh, I would bet on the long end all day long. And the reason I would is because I believe that you know, you get you get into these these 10 years, for example, or the 20 years, you're locking in that yield for a very long period of time. And uh, I I really believe rates are going to go lower than they ever have been before in in the history of America. And I think everyone listening, uh, and, and this is, again, not personalized advice, it's just sort of like blanket advice, <laughs> which is not financial advice. <laughs> Uh, but I think everybody should be exposed to assets, real assets like stocks and real estate, because I believe that as rates go lower than where they were pre-COVID, as as you know, capitalism continues to drive prices down, and now there's actually this like resistance to printing money, uh, which we will so we'll go back to printing money, but there'll be resistance to printing for the sake of spending, at least to some degree, because of the inflation we had. Like for example, I believe. If you have a Republican Congress after the election, it's going to be hard to spend as much money as we had during COVID because of the inflation that was had. And there'll be a lot of resistance to that. If you have a Democratic Congress, but it's like split by Republicans, you're going to have massive tightenings on those purse strings and on government spending because there'll be so much fear that inflation will just come roaring right back. So that'll actually help lead to potentially deflation and lower rates than we've ever seen before because of the shell shock nature of what we just went through and people not wanting to spend money again. So I actually think you're going to have lower rates than you've ever had before. Uh, I believe that you should mark your calendars for like September and October of 2033. And, uh, and your calendar should say, Kevin predict meet Kevin predicted that mortgage rates were 1.8% on the 30 year mortgage. And people, you know, I said that before and people are like, that's insane. That's, that's crazy. Why would you say that? I'm like, you don't have to believe it that I, be, the reason like my, my thesis for that is very simple. Uh, I think capitalism and artificial intelligence is re going to be extremely good at creating additional joblessness, uh, at re uh, massively increasing productivity, uh, massively increasing the available, uh, uh, funds that our society has to invest, not to spend, to invest. And that's going to be why, via the sort of winner take most uh, mentality that we'll probably see play out in the stock market. You know, people are like, oh, why are the big seven, you know, driving all the stock gains? Because they're the best companies that exist. It's really simple. They they make most of the money. So that's why their stock goes up the most because they've figured out how to make the most amount of money. So all of this, I think, comes together to drive yields substantially down. Uh, over the next decade. I mean, think about it. We were at 2.8% yields in uh, on the 30-year mortgage in 2019. Europe was uh, at like 1% uh, mortgage rates with negative interest rates on, on a savings. Do you remember before all this like COVID drama, we were talking about uh, negative yields on bank accounts. Negative yields. It's absolutely crazy. It's insane. And I think that'll come back. Jay's channel here says, good morning, Kev. Congrats on passing your test. Thank you. Uh, all six tests done in three months. That's an average of passing one test every two weeks. That was hard. Like, yeah, I, I feel I feel exhausted after that. Somebody says, why, why is CNBC not Bloomberg? Yeah, we can pop over to Bloomberg and listen to a little bit of Bloomberg. Anyway, we're going to pull up some research here in a moment. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Pretty, uh, pretty clear. I've been pretty clear about this thesis for for quite a while, uh, and I may have been a little early on it, but 
I've been pretty clear on it for a while, and I think it'll play out very well in the longer term. Outperforming over the past two months, and while the S and P 500 just a whisker away from that all-time high, the equal weighted index still has a lot of ground to make up. John, the S and P getting closer and closer. Katie, thank you for that. Michael Harnett over at Bank of America capturing this almost perfectly in a survey of global fund managers, showing the most upbeat sentiment since January 2022. Investors expecting a Goldilocks environment in 2024, bolstered by expectations of Fed. Easing. Joining us now to discuss John Hancock's Matt Miskin, JP Morgan's Monica DiCenzo, and Mohammed Al Aaron of Queen's College Cambridge still with us. Monica, I want to come straight to you. How expensive is that soft landing hope dream, that story for next year? How expensive is it now? <laughs> it's been funny to watch markets. You know, sitting here a year ago, everyone was so paranoid and scared about what they thought was going to be a recession that was a sure thing. And now fast forward, equities are up 20%. And now everyone's crippled because they think things are too bullish and they've missed it. And, and so for clients I work with, what's really expensive is to sit in cash and keep watching the next phase of this cycle. And so we've been really focused on how to get invested, make sure you're still meeting the goals that you've outlined, because sitting in cash is not going to do it. Matt Miskin, what are you telling people? Yeah, things have gotten expensive. And over the course of the year, we've gotten almost 20% of the return from multiple expansion. I wish that multiple expansion just could continue into next year, but it's going to be hard to do. We're at about almost 19 times. The July high was about 19 and a half. You know, Albert Einstein said that compound interest was the seventh winner of the world, not multiple expansion. Um, oh. So we want to actually find places to get income into next year. We want to make sure we're compounding interest, staying invested, we have played the quality factor in the U.S. over the course of the year. That has done well for us. But frankly, we're looking to trim some risk into next year. So, Matt, speak to Monica's point about people feeling uncomfortable in cash. What do you say to clients that say, you may be right, but the alternative is worse? So we're looking at locking in those rates for those clients. And we actually see more of a disinflationary environment into next year based on the housing data catching up from that lagged effect. Mm -hmm. And we actually think that the bond market is a better place to lock in higher rates for longer. I know that the bond market has priced in a lot of rate hikes in, in quick order here from the Fed pivot. Um, but in our view, that's where you want to be for that kind of capital. On the equity side, we're just trying to find more defensive, higher quality businesses to be long term investors. But frankly, earnings growth estimates look high, multiples look high. So we want to find cheaper parts of the market that offer us better return potential. So Monica, based yeah. All right. Well, good luck. So uh, let's uh, let's jump in over here. This is uh, this is an interesting piece right here. So this is a B of A piece talking about uh, the. Oh, actually, I want to actually start with this Goldman piece right here. So I wanted to talk about the Red Sea disruptions. A lot of folks have been very concerned about this, uh, rightfully so. I think it's a pretty negative catalyst right now, although. Uh, like we talked about a little bit earlier in the live stream in the event that you weren't here yet at that point. Uh, I want you to look at the oil price chart for Brent. That's the more expensive of the two when you look at the chart. Okay? It's the international blend. You'll see virtually no movement in the oil price market. Which is really interesting because apparently the oil market doesn't care that much. Well, here's a Goldman piece. We provide early thoughts on uh, on the disruption to energy flows through the Bob El Mondeb Strait at the southern end of the Red Sea. The disruption is unlikely to have a large effect on crude oil and natural gas prices, liquefied natural gas, because vessel redirection opportunities imply that production should not be affected. So like I mentioned, and I said this, before I read this piece, just a, like well, 20 minutes ago, I'm like, so it's just going to add to lead times a little bit. But that doesn't change supply. The supply is still there. So you just got to have to pre-order a little bit earlier. We do estimate that a prolonged redirection of 7 million barrels of oil per day would raise spot crude prices 3 to $4. And that's it. 3 to $4. Because a 15-day increase in journey would reduce global available commercial inventories, all else equal. So a little adjustment to that delay, basically, they think is worth about four to uh, three to four dollars. We estimate the largest effects from a full redirection on clean and dirtier tanker freight rates 
of, uh, and this is for natural gas, about four, four bucks, four bucks and one bucks, one buck for clean versus dirtier. Because freight supply is highly inelastic. It's, uh, that's interesting. That's so freight supplies, the, your, the ability to ship it. It's not that the point of that is it's not that easy to very quickly, uh, um, hop in on, on like making a new oil tanker, right? Somebody says, yeah, the uh, yield curve needs to reinvert. Yeah. Well, so if the yield curve reinverts, that means we want, uh, basically the twos being lower, which means more of a, a, a rally in the shorter term. That's true. Uh, but I don't know that, you know, I don't know how steep we're going to invert. And I also don't know when we're going to reinvert. You know, we could stay inverted for quite frankly, through the election. So it's anybody's guess. Yes. You could look at the inverted yield curve and go, okay, well, if we're going to have a soft landing, we should uninvert. Nobody says when. So it's, it's all, it's all betting, right? Which is fine. It's higher clean freight rates, but it's not a bad argument. I, I do think that argument is true. Uh, you know, and, and a way to play that is is just have a diversified like laddered portfolio, you know, where you have your ones, your twos, your fives, your tens, your twenties, and your thirties. Just divide across them. Go to treasury direct gov and divide across. So, you know, all right. Energy price effect, a uh, bull steepening is basically when, when, uh, easiest way to put it, bull, when you hear people say bull steepening, what they're saying is, uh, yields as a whole are coming down, uh, but the 10 year is falling, or sorry, the two year is falling quicker. So both of them are going down, but the two is falling at a quicker rate. And that's to reinvert the curve while everything's going down. That's in contrast to a bear steepening where all the rates are going up in the opposite way I just said. All right. Energy price effects from hypothetical closure would be much larger for the Strait of Hermos. That's what I said yesterday. Uh, I said the Strait of Hermos is, is, is much more risky. That's where you had that uh, um, tanker blockade. We estimate that oil prices in this tail scenario would rise 20% after the first month of uh, 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 interruption. In the Strait of Hormoz, which is much, much, much more than the like, you know, what, um, two or three percent you're getting now. Markets now price in a very low possibility of this outcome. Of course. What happened? Numerous shipping companies, uh, including uh, those involved in transportation of oil, have halted shipments through the Red Sea following an escalation of attacks by Houthi militants. In Yemen, on ships bypassing the narrow strait, no companies have indicated a timeline for how long. I, I want to see some more U.S. defenses over there, honestly. Most of Saudi's western seaborne exports through the Red Sea now flow through the Suez Canal. Uh, or the uh, uh, Sumed Pipeline. Ooh, I actually know about that. Rather than through... The Bob El Mondab. Oh, that's interesting. So they're basically suggesting here most of your Saudi exports essentially bypass this anyway. Oh, that's very interesting. So whoop, here we go. How much oil flows through here? Well, we've covered this, and so it looks like they're breaking down a few different blends here. We've got 7 million barrels of oil through the strait, 3 million of this northbound. About 1.4 dirty and 1.6 clean. 4 million barrels of southbound flows directed predominantly towards Asia. Which has increased significantly because of the Russia-Ukraine war. Some more charts, some breakdowns. What would rerouting the oil flows look like as it started to happen? Largely correspond uh, to northbound exports. So oil flows through this are largely the northbound exports going to Europe with significant Russian oil flowing southbound. And, and they're not trying to attack the southbound ships because they want to attack the ones supporting Israel. Uh, Houthis specifically targeting Israeli north 
bound ships. I mean, it's possible they could attack everything, but that, that's been the target. And so of the 7 million that goes through, 43% is northbound. 43% northbound. So that already softens the blow. Oh, I love this kind of stuff. I don't know about you, but I, I love this kind of stuff. At some point, the Houthis will get slapped. Oh, for sure. Kevin, mortgage renewal in 2024, two to four year fixed. That's six, eight to six, two or five year variable. What do you think? Uh, so I personally never do variables. Well, for for like Fannie Freddie loans. Like when I have the option of a 30 year fixed, I'll always take it. I can't do that with commercial usually, you know, like a business. You're generally more of variables, but but I've I've always said that I believe the best thing for people individually is a 30 year fixed. Always. Because you can't guarantee that you'll be able to refinance. What if you get injured? What if you're temporarily out of work? What if the economy shifts? Uh, I, I do not uh, think variable loans are ever a good choice. When rates go down, you can refinance and just take negative points. Okay. Don't be stupid and pay points right now. I am literally like, I, I don't know why I did this, but the other day I scrolled, like this was maybe like three weeks ago. I scrolled through Reddit at the real estate section. I'm like, oh, this is disgusting. First of all, the second of all, I'm like, what is this? People are paying points to buy down their interest rate today as interest rates are about to plummet. Like, that's the stupidest thing ever. You're going to refinance next year and basically pay for two loans, you moron. Oh, this is why we need financial education in schools. People don't even know what points are. And it's fine. Like, if you're not in the industry, I get it. But, like, talk to somebody who understands this stuff. Anyway. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right. Back to this. It's so painful. It's so painful. I, I, I make, like, a short on this or something. I get my yellow legal pad here that I turned into a coaster. Okay, give me some short ideas. What do you all want me to make short videos on? I'll, I'll, I'll go. I, I, I'm starting a. I'm going to start a short series today, where I just start bitching about stuff, and that's going to be one of them. Uh, points. <laughs> uh. No idea what points are. <laughs> what are points? <laughs> percentage of loan amount. One point is one percent of the loan amount. You get a four hundred thousand dollar loan. One point is four thousand dollars. <laughs> and then guess what? Fifty bips are. Fifty bips is like a fee that you could pay on your loan. Fifty bips is half of a point. Fifty bips is two thousand dollars on a four hundred k loan. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Uh, you like to cry about Elon? No, I love Elon. He, he, he respond, bro. Did you see he responded to an e-hack post? Bro, we're snowballing. We're snowballing. The snowball is beginning. Look at this. Look on screen here. Look at this. I post an e-hack story on Twitter and Elon replies. Woo! <laughs> uh... Elon, <laughs> as in uh, e-hack, as in Elon hack. <laughs> rent versus mortgage. That's a good one. You know, rent v. buy is always good. I like that. All right, keep leaving me some. Let's go listen to the bell, and I'm going to write down some more here, uh, some more of your short suggestions here. I'm putting my editor to work on shorts today. Uh, he's actually really good at doing it. Stunning rebuke of the plaintiff's bar. Stunning. Because they they have all this, they have all these these experts that are ready to talk. And they say the experts ain't no experts. Now, this is what J&J &J is hoping for when it comes to tout litigation. They have a number of uh, investigations of the people, of the plaintiff's lawyers, but it has not happened in part because I think that the uh, women who have died are dying with cancer are very Completely different things and completely different oh, companies. Yeah. Two different companies at this point. Yeah, very different. I only mentioned it because yep. J&J is hoping to. Might be a company that's where we're at. That's it. 
Let's get the opening bell here. You see Marshawn Lynch at the big board, the NFL what? legend. Why? Why did he ring the bell twice? How? How did they not have a moderator? You're not supposed to do that. Yeah, he's getting scolded right now. Did you see him? He's like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it ain't a toy, bro. <laughs> oh, that's how they get in trouble at the exchange. Oh, my gosh. That's funny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> ay, ay, ay. All right. Look at this, folks. A firm up 7%. That's when you know you're in a risk on rally. <laughs> Holy moly. 47 bucks. End phase uh, up 169, trying to turn red a little bit though. Q's trying to go up. Tesla's trying to move up. Apple's trying to move up. Apple's up about a quarter. NVIDIA dropping about 1.44. Affirm's now up eight. End phase up two. Etsy 162. Let's go see. I want to start with losers here. Uh, Snap. Snapchat's losing. And there's Zim. Oh, that's interesting. Zim stock's actually coming down. Snapchat. How have they been doing? Oh, well, they've been doing just fine. Yeah. Coming off that bottom there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I yeah, firm, firm at 420% year to date. That's funny. Yeah, it's tough though because, you know, you just hold something like this. I look at the pain you would have gone through, you know? So it's it's scary. Uh, this was one of the ones that I sold back in um, Jan of 22. I'm like, I ain't going to a recession holding a firm. Uh, I don't know. I don't even remember how much the darn thing was back then. Jan of 22. Look at that. Dude, January of 22, this thing was $100. So like... Even if you sold it in Jan of 22 when I sold and you rebought it today, you would still be getting a 50% discount after a 420% rally off the bottom this year. See what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, and, and who knows? Maybe it'll go back to $100. But I would rather make the bet, personally, at this point of like a Tesla doubling than an Affirm doubling from here. But it's possible. You know, these or like Enphase. These, these risk, it's too much risk for me. Uh, but so far this end phase breakout is working really well. I've been, I've had these yellow lines here for too long and we had our first breakout on those yellow lines right here. And, uh, and here we go. We are, we are explode. I, I, I think we're, we're going to be going straight back to about 160 here from a technical analysis point of view. And, uh, if we can break 160, we're going over two. That's my take. Tesla keeps getting rejected at 258, by the way. So Tesla really needs to break 258. So we got some work to do here. And NVIDIA needs to break five. Like, look at how many times it gets rejected here. This is, I'm going to call this essentially a rejection here. Right here, I mean, that's 481, but you're basically rejected. Uh, this is the week chart, mind you. Let's go to the day chart. Yeah, yeah, this will make it easier. This is basically, we're getting too close to five, a rejection. You're getting rejected multiple times here at holding over five, rejected again. And now you're like, you're teetering on rejection, but there's a chance you could break out on this. If you could break out on this for NVIDIA, uh, I mean, like there, the, I, I'm just going to have to rewrite the fibs because I'm not, I'm not here to tell you it's going to go to 731, but let's just say I start selling in the sevens. <laughs> uh, so yeah, here's, here's a firm. Good job, a firm. Uh, Etsy's coming off its bottom as well. Let's see what else is going on. You've got PayPal's coming off its bottom. I think so is Disney. Uh, Disney, a little bit more volatile coming off its bottom. Trade Desk right now. It's, uh, you know, it's got, oh, what an interesting trend here. Let's draw some trends. I see that from a mile away. This something looks sexy over here. All right. Oh, look at this. Uh, it's not as clean as I thought it would be when I first saw a glance there. But uh, I see I see this trend, which almost looks like a channel. If I draw, come on, bro. There we go. Get some purple in here. And let's see what we got. Yeah. Bro, I just colored it purple. What is this nonsense? There we go. Something like that. So here's 
uh, again, not not the best, not the best uh, or cleanest here. It, it looked a little cleaner in my head when I saw it, but uh, you you clearly have a downtrend on Trade Desk, and uh, it wouldn't surprise me. You get a break above this, you're you're easy to eighty five. So that's an interesting one to pay attention to. Uh, Into it's another one I really want exposure to, but I can't do it at this level. I need a little bit of like technical bearishness. And I actually think we'll get that when we get, uh, <coughs> excuse me. I actually think we'll get that technical bear bearishness when we, uh, uh, when we start getting some small business rollover, some, some negative comps for into it and growth starts going away. These people print money, like lots and lots of money. Uh, so pretty excited about them, but, uh, but it's just the valuation. It's, it's a little stretchy right now. So that's that's my take. I was listening here for a moment. Airbus and Boeing. And Airbus is sold through. So is David shaming? Has, has that been neutralized? Did you have to bring it up? <laughs> I was thinking this is the only time I, last, I, I haven't heard him mention Boeing without blaming me. No, that's boring. There's nothing going on here. Okay, fine. We'll look for some more stuff here. I, uh, quick reminder, by the way, if you haven't seen the house hack valuation update, valuation update for my real estate startup, uh, go to the description down below. You'll see the house hack YouTube channel. Uh, and then on that House Hack YouTube channel, you'll see the last video we posted. It's like a 30-minute full update. We talk valuation. We talk credit lines. We talk fundraising, how much fundraised, uh, priorities. It's really cool. And so you'll see a lot about uh, running a startup and all of the uh, the goodies that go into that. So uh, I think that's pretty cool. So if you haven't checked that out yet, it's linked down below. Maybe watch it after this. We're going to go to the course member live stream in about 10 minutes. So we're going to do a little bit more analysis here on this uh, canal issue. Uh, so we'll look at that. And then we'll look at some other uh, research as well. I want to look at fund flows as well. So we're going to do that here in the next few minutes. Uh, but again, tab that open for the Hesac. So going back over here to this canal. While we take no view on the likelihood of prolonged closure of the strait, any closures could keep tankers, any closure could keep tankers originating in the Persian Gulf from transitioning or transiting uh, the uh, Suez Canal or reaching some pipeline, forcing them to divert around the tip of Africa, which could significantly increase transit times by approximately 15 days. We estimate on average, uh, leading to a sharp increase in demand for freight and thus tanker rates. Several companies have already announced they've begun diverting uh, from various different areas, uh, from various different companies around the tip of Africa. Uh, do you expect a disruption in oil production? No, would not lead to production shut-ins. The supply can bypass the strait or head to alternative destinations. And what would the impact on oil prices uh, be from a potential long shutdown? No direct impact, hypothetical prolonged closure. Would still amount to net tightening for oil balances, though, a little bit. Freight markets. Freight market is highly inelastic. We uh, exhibiting significantly nonlinear pricing over time. We calculate that a 1% increase in oil tanker demand leads to a 0.5% increase in freight rates. Therefore, a potential uh, 100 uh, million barrel increase in oil on water, split 65-30, would increase freight rates by 25% to 55%. Wow, that's huge. That's that's a that's a huge potential increase there on freight rates. Really interesting. I'll write that down. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. All right. Very interesting. Let's now look at some flows. Flows, baby. Flows. First Christmas package is delayed. I, don't, I think it's more of an oil concern than a Christmas package concern. But uh, a firm's memeing right now. It's like 11% right now. Wow, look at that. It's not time to start tanker hack. Heck yeah. <laughs> I want to be like, I wanna, my role model. Who's that Who's that guy uh, from uh, uh, Nordic American tankers? We love dividends. We will pay Massive dividends. We make so much money. Remember that guy? That guy <laughs> That guy lives rent-free in my head when he came on CNBC uh, during COVID. And he's bragging about how much money they make. 
Nordic American takes. I'll, I don't think I'll ever forget that one. We love dividends. He should be a meme. <laughs> All right. Let's pop in. Uh... Oh, yeah, we're here. Global fund manager survey. Most upbeat since Jan of 2022 on Goldilocks. Goldilocks 2024. Investors cut cash to 4.5% from 4.7% two-year low and increased equity to overweight. Most enter 2024 bearish commodities relative to bonds. Interesting. Okay, hold on a sec. Let me just see if they have something here while I fix it. Gonna... On, for example, the iPhone. We, what? we know they pay an enormous amount to Apple right. every year to be the exclusive provider of search on your iPhone. Oh, this is like what risk Apple potentially has on the Google exposure. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So uh, 50% of fund manager survey investors expect weaker global growth, okay? But more than seven out of 10 predict a soft landing. Hmm. It seems like the mainstream thought is all of a sudden becoming soft landing. Investors see hard landing as the number one tail risk in 2024. Just two out of 10 see it as a base case. That makes sense. Enphase now sitting at a, almost 5%, 2% on Trade Desk, Tesla 1%. Uh, Costco's down 1.29. Let's go. I'm shorting it. <laughs> um, open door. Boy, they're up and down like 6% every day. Down 6%, up 6 Volatile. You know, open door is like my, the, one of my biggest motivations to just like replace. Open door. I think it's a bad company. It's a $2.9 billion company. I'm like, if they can do it, I'm going to do it. <laughs> oh, look at this. Open door co-founder is stepping down at the end of the year. Intent to resign. Weak sauce. Yeah. Ah, it's so exciting. 91% <laughs> say Fed rate hikes are over. Yeah. Expectations of lower rates, 89%. Bond yields at 62% are at record highs this century. As most investors since 2008 say monetary policy is too restrictive. Bonds and tech are seen as the biggest winners in 2024. How funny. My ETF is like all tech and then, uh, and then house hack is like pretty heavy bonds right now. <laughs> and of course the real estate we're buying. Best hard landing contrarian trade, long cash, short, magnificent seven. That's the best contrarian trade. Boy, that just sounds like suicide, but okay. I, I, I all right. And uh, what else here? Charts of the month. This is fund manager survey, growth expectations. Wow, look at that coming out of that bottom over there on the right. See that right there? Look at that bottom, that sentiment bottom. We went lower than the global financial crisis. Holy smokes. Cash levels drop in the fund manager survey. Global growth expectations to improve but remain weak. Profit outlook, nice. Improving. Soft landings becoming the consensus. China real estate seen as, oh, most likely source for a systemic credit event. Ooh, that's an interesting line. Oh, is Barkin talking? I don't see that. Oh, yeah, you're right. Barkin, if inflation comes down nicely, Fed will respond. Nicely positioned, given outlook for economy. Markets are going to do what they do. Well, yeah. Uh, U.S. government debt is only seen as a 10% chance of default right now. Well, like like a, a, a credit risk. That's what I say. I'm like, I think, I, I know the debt is too high, but I think the odds of a problem there is very low for now. Eventually, we will. U.S. commercial real estate, big deal, shadow banking. That's like a firm right there for you. And then Chinese real estate. How interesting. This is very cool. I like this. Dude, I need to make another cup of coffee. Even though I might not seem like it, I'm dying. I need coffee. 
Uh, I'm going to push the course line back like five minutes <clears throat> so I can make coffee. And then let me quickly see if there's anything else right here. Uh, I'm going to keep scrolling down this. Take your screenshots while I do Even that. though I'm a licensed financial advisor, real estate broker, and becoming a stock broker, this video is neither personalized financial advice nor real estate advice for you. It is not tax, legal, or otherwise personalized advice tailored to you. This video yeah. provides generalized perspective, information, and commentary. Any third-party content I show should not be deemed endorsed by me. This video is not and shall never be deemed reasonably sufficient information for the purpose of evaluating a security or investment decision. Any links or promoted products are either paid affiliations or products or services to which we may benefit from. I personally operate and actively manage ETF and hold long positions in various securities, potentially including those mentioned in this video. However, I have no relationship to any issuers other than House Act, nor am I presently acting as a market maker. Most crowded trade long the Magnificent Seven. How interesting. Investors overweight tech versus energy. Yeah, no kidding. All right, I got to go make my coffee. Thanks so much, everybody, for being here. Appreciate y'all. Go yourself. See, that's is that clear? <laughs> no, no, no. Seriously, thank you. Thank you for being here and all the support. Go check out that house hack video if you haven't yet. End phase five point eight. Let's go. Let's go. How's Tesla surviving? Ah, just one percent. Loser. Stuck in the mud. Loser. All right, we'll see you.